Warning. The following podcast contains graphic content that may be disturbing or triggering to some listeners. Discretion is advised. The Papa Tango Sierra Delta podcast is available free of charge thanks to the support of Cracked Armor. Their mission is to raise awareness for PTSD, TBI, and mental health to support those who struggle. By creating an army of warriors who represent the gear, their hope is that it will send a message to others that they are not alone. Go to crackedarmor.com. Say hi to Mark Long, read about the story, and find some research information about PTSD. And if you can, look good while supporting Cracked Armor by buying some gear. Ten nine. Did you say Papa Tango Sierra Delta? There's so much left to do, so many things I want to see and I see. Don't make the change. If it rains every single day, I'll fight to blow it all away. This is episode 28 of the Papa Tango Sierra Delta podcast. My name is Larry Payton and I have been diagnosed with complex post-traumatic stress. I've been saying for about the last decade that when I die, I want to be cremated and I want my ashes to go to my, well, my paradise, my special place, somewhere I love. The one place in the world that I really don't have any shitty memories associated with. The one place in the world that I've actually been able to truly relax. That place is Hawaii. I'm bringing this up today on account of what's happened in Maui over the last few days. If you haven't seen, western part of Maui has burned. And I mean burned. It's absolutely horrifying. I have friends over there. Luckily, I know that Garrett Marrero, who is the owner of Maui Brewing, is safe. I've seen him post. Another friend, Patrick Welts, who is the brewer for Waikiki Brewing on Front Street. I have not been able to contact Patrick. I know Front Street and pretty much all of Lahaina is completely destroyed. Front Street is like a, I mean, it's just a remarkable place. Well, I guess it was a remarkable place. It was absolutely beautiful. Just very old shops there. Had a huge, beautiful, very old tree. There was Waikiki Brewing. I just recorded a podcast there about a year and a half ago for one of my other shows that I did a while ago called Brewer's Banter. And it just, man, I can't believe it's destroyed. The fire traveled rapidly on account of Hurricane Dora being just off the island. And I saw that winds were well above 80 miles an hour. That caused the fire to just jump all over the place. Uh, Burning embers apparently were going up into the sky and starting files a mile or more away from where the original fire actually was. It continued and it burned hard. I've seen videos of people stuck in traffic jams in cars with fire just all around them. Just, I mean, right next to them. You can hear the fear in their voices. Some people had to actually jump into the ocean. They had nowhere to go. They were caught. They were trapped. And they jumped in the ocean just to stay alive. Take into account that they had a hurricane going by. So the water was rough. It was not a safe place to be either. Again, my understanding is Lahaina is gone. And I don't think much happened in Ka'anapali, which is where we typically stay. Just another maybe 10 minutes down the road from Lahaina. Um, my understanding is there was some burning that got close, and I'm not sure if it hit Kihei. I'm not sure if it hit Wailea. But there's a lot lost in Hawaii. Worse than property being lost, and certainly such carnage, is the fact that as of today, there's been 36 people that have died as a result. There were people with severe burns, critical condition that had to be flown off Maui and taken over to Oahu for the hospital in Honolulu. It's devastating. I mean, especially when you consider how beautiful it is there. And I mean, the land is beautiful, the ocean is beautiful, and the people are beautiful. 
the Aloha spirit is unreal. It's just something I'd never experienced before in my life. We've been to Hawaii several times and we keep going back just because it's that one place that I can unplug. It's that one place that we enjoy. We feel safe. We feel comfortable. We can relax. And boom, like that, a huge part of the place that we love is destroyed and people have lost their lives. I'm really not sure what the hell is going on this year. I mean, in the past, I don't know, maybe what, two, two and a half months here in Nova Scotia, we've had wildfires that were out of control and devastating. After almost a week, we got some rain, but then the rain just didn't stop and it kept going and going. Short time after that, we had rain here. Well, it's never been so much rain fall here since a hurricane hit in 1970. There's flooding pretty much everywhere. It cost the lives of four people, a grown man, a youth, and two children. I know at least some of them died trying to escape their house at something around four o'clock in the morning. And when they got on the road, their vehicle was swept by rushing water and it took them into a hay field. Well, what was a hay field? But because of the amount of rain we had, and I mean, it was in a matter of hours, it took them into a flooded hay field. So flooded that it was a lake. Wildfires in British Columbia that have cost the lives of two young firefighters. Wildfires in Quebec. It's just been unreal what's going on. I guess all I'm trying to say is we need to be there for each other. You know, I mean, this is how we're going to get through all this shit, I guess, and what's yet to come. My thoughts and my prayers go to everyone down in Maui because everyone in some way or another has been affected by this. My thoughts and prayers go to families of those who have lost loved ones and as well as families of those who yet are unable to reach their loved ones and are terrified without knowing if they're alive, if they're suffering, if they're in hospital, or if they're dead. And I also want to pass along my sincere gratitude and love for the first responders who did everything they could to battle this place. No doubt, they were overwhelmed. Absolutely overwhelmed. To the firefighters in Maui, thank you for everything you did. I know you did your best. I know you did. And although sometimes it may not feel like it, you guys and girls did an amazing job and it could have been significantly worse. To the police officers that were up blocking roads, getting people out of homes, trying to keep everyone safe, thank you. Again, you did all you could. And to the paramedics, well... There's a lot more lives that would have been lost if it wasn't for you. Thank you very much for what you have done. And for, again, everyone else in Hawaii, everyone else in Maui, thoughts and prayers are with you. Be there for each other. Help each other. Watch out for each other. Take a quick break. Please leave a rating at your preferred podcasting service. Hey, you know what's even better than a rating? If you take a moment to actually write a review, that'd be awesome. And we are back from the break. Thanks for sticking around for the remainder of the Papa Tango Sierra Delta podcast. On this episode, we have husband and wife team, Andrea and Lawrence Christensen. Lawrence is a retired member of the Canadian Armed Forces. It's great to have you guys here. Welcome to the show today. Thanks. Thanks, Larry. I just uh, going to take a minute because I wanted to do this and, and thank you for what you're doing. It's, uh, it's fucking amazing. I was taken aback the first podcast I ever listened to and I thought, wow, this, this guy's got guts. You know, it's real courage to throw ourselves out there and expose ourselves at what for me was probably my worst, worst part of my life. And not too many people knew it. So I, d I didn't have to share that. And I'm thinking it's the same with you. So 
Yeah, thanks, brother. I really do appreciate those words, Lawrence. I really do, and I do understand you, and I'm beside you, which I know you've listened to the podcasts, and so I'm confident that you know I'm beside you. I'm really glad that you guys reached out, and it's going to be the first time during the podcast that we actually have a husband and wife team on to speak for the one show, which is amazing because the reality is that a person who struggles with PTSD doesn't keep it to themselves. It bleeds into our relationships, our partners, our spouses, children, with whomever we live. The reality is, again, that other people get to experience post-traumatic stress along with us, even though we are the ones that have been diagnosed. So, no, oh, the the families the families bear those wounds too, Larry. Absolutely, brother. Absolutely. You know, it's it's so true. Absolutely. So, you know what? Let's Lawrence. Let's start off because this story starts off with you. So if you could, please introduce yourself and tell us about your journey. I joined the military as a teenager, left high school to get on a train to Cornwallis. And uh, that was quite a few years ago. Uh, I ended up serving for for 28 years. Uh, My first 11 years or so in a combat arms trade, I did uh, 84 months of foreign service documented um, in that first basically 11 years. So I was away a lot. My first injury, because I don't like, it's a traumatic injury, physical, um, mental, they're, they're injuries. There's not, it's not a, a condition. But my first injury was in 1982, and uh, we were never debriefed on any of it. It was just crazy. And I can remember thinking that I was a coward um, because I was so scared in the situation. We saved the man's life that we didn't know. But I, I lived with that that feeling of, of being a coward because I was so scared, not realizing what real courage is at the time. And no one, no one explained it to me. I, I don't believe anyone was able at the time. That's a long time ago. So I struggled through that army career, uh, trying to prove to myself, because I don't know if anyone else thought I was a coward. They, they didn't know inside. They didn't feel those feelings, that that music. And uh, so I, I was always trying to do things, volunteering and you know, doing the scary stuff that I thought was scary to prove to myself. But the other side of that was I couldn't sleep. I was a single guy and I was living in barracks and I'd live out, but I was always by myself because I was what I thought out of my mind. I was, I was not sleeping. Um, I'm not, I'm, I'm angry at everybody. I'm, I'm yelling at people. I'm, I'm going out to bars to fight and just to, to validate a drink. And I mean, I started using drugs and, you know, I'm I'm now in recovery. Um, been a long time since I drank or used. That's great, but a lot of that spilled over into behaviors. Um, so I was just, and all that was, it, it was working to help my problem because it was numbing everything. I was instant gratification and. Being able to sleep, I get drunk, I can sleep because I drank so much I passed out. I was such a drinker and everyone knew me as a drinker. We came down to Trenton to get on a Herc to jump back to Anzio in Petawawa. And I came out of a blackout in the back of the Herc, standing up, look this way, check your equipment. And I'm like, H, H, <laughs> like, what's going on? He goes, don't worry, man, we dressed you. It's okay. <laughs> and then he turned to another guy and got him to check his equipment because he didn't trust me to check my equipment. Like, that kind of lunacy and just still going on every day. Get up in the morning, PT, half drunk and, you know, or, or high, I, drinking tequila first thing in the morning to make your day because that gave me the courage that I thought was courage and it wasn't, I was just getting worse and worse, Uh, you know, and volunteering for deployments can't, can't wait to, to go on that next deployment. And 
it was a never ending battle that I was losing, drastically losing. I ended up joining the Air Force because that's what everyone was doing. We remuster and, you know, get a trade so you can use it when you get out. And uh, I get to the, the Air Force and I'm building engines for Boeing 707s and Herks. And I ended up one morning coming in and I wasn't drunk. And everyone told me, you know, maybe you need to go to MIR, go to the hospital. You don't look that good, man, because I didn't have anything to drink that morning. Wow. And that was kind of a click in my head. Yeah. You know, so I asked for help. I ended up asking for help then and getting it. And I still hadn't met my wife because I just I stopped drinking because that was OK and, and it was good. So I'm going to be fine. But then doing the behaviors and like uh, meeting people and the sexual addictions and uh, still raging and trying to be that tough guy. It was just, like I said, it was an insanity that had me and still no one is pointing a finger till I was, I was in treatment. Um, and I'd met my wife and she's putting up with this crazy man and I could put on a facade to a point, but start hiding from the people outside my home. But I can't hide from her. And and who's the people that we take it out on the worst is those people that we think will never leave. Or maybe exactly. we're hoping they'll leave. So anyways, then I get pointed out, like, maybe you have some trauma issues. <sighs> I that was I actually I just jumped ahead. So maybe we need to go back a bit and uh, talk about my last deployment was in 04 and just the work up up to that deployment, getting ready for that deployment. Uh, I was just spinning. I was out of my my mind, but hiding it well and go on a deployment. We come back and I am just so angry because it was all there again. What I'd been pushing down, what I'd been thinking I was dealing with, it was all back. I was yelling at my, I had like a four-year-old son and uh, I was, there was, there was one morning he didn't want to wear a specific shirt. And I heard him in the bedroom with with Andy and they were fighting about it because he wanted, and I went, I stormed in there yelling at this little kid, this tiny little person, like I was going to rip his head off. And I'm, so I'm, and finally I'm just, you do what you're told and I'm leaving the house and He's screaming at me like, I'm sorry, daddy. I'm sorry, daddy. <laughs> you know, and it just, it, it it hurts me to this day that I was like that with, with him, but yeah. just out of control. Yeah, I understand. I do. I don't know what the real turning point was for me. I don't know if I've hit my turning point. I, I think I have. <laughs> and I'm being laughed at here. But you know, then, then again, those are those key points in my life when I look and I say, you, you really need to do something about this. And so I started, I started asking for help, demanding help. I, I did a lot of things. I, I turned to programs with, with Soldier On and, uh, you know, I had a counselor and the, the recovery through sport. Um, I, I'm, I think pretty athletic. So the soldier on program, I was trying to do some and trying to find my niche. Um, Andy's just prodded me about horses because I, I went and did their saddle up program. Um, I met uh, I met a gentleman, Paul Nichols is his name, and uh, he founded Community for Veterans, uh, and he was he rode his horse across Canada. Stopped along the way, brought horses with him, and had veterans ride with him across Canada, like in little legs. And I heard about this guy, so I went and saw him here in Trenton. They did a stop at the Repatriation Memorial uh, here in Trenton. And uh, I wanted to see this crazy guy riding a horse across Canada. 
So I, I ended up riding with him into old Fort Henry in Kingston. And it was just, it was almost comfortable being on that horse and being, being, you know, talking to him, he's kind of like he was us. He had done uh, some time in Bosnia and uh, he was in the pocket. And uh, so uh, he faced his own struggles. And you know what? His wife, I, I use a phrase now that his wife taught me. She said, uh, Paul used to struggle or say he struggles with PTSD. And uh, he no longer does that. He lives with it. And I hear someone say they struggle with it. I don't anymore. I live with it. I've done some things to manage my symptoms. Horses is one of them. Uh, a horse can really tell me what I'm what I'm acting like. Uh, there was one time with my trainer, I couldn't get my horse to do anything. It was just, but it was one of these days that I was I was off and I was angry and I was just in my head spinning around. And uh, she said to me, she said, uh, how are you feeling? Are you okay? And I said, well, I got a little bit going on. She said, you know what? Maybe go calm down, take your time, took a break, came back, and all of a sudden my horse was better. Well, it wasn't my horse was better. I was better. I did some grounding. And um, so I get all over the place. Like I said, I'm, uh, uh, I'm not all that sure. I, like I said, Sport really helps me, and uh, there was uh, uh, my counselor knew that I I did I was kind of physical. I, I liked PT. I liked working out. I ran a lot, um, and she suggested there was a a winter sports clinic that's put on by CADS Canadian Adaptive Winter Sports Snow Sport uh, in Calabogie, and they spend a week every year in February, and they get veterans on skis or on sit skis or uh, there's snowshoeing, there's uh, what any winter sports, sledge hockey, um, and we go out. So she suggested that I contact this guy because they were looking for participants this one year. And I'd never ski. I skied once in Germany and was really drunk and didn't make it down the hill and just took the gondola back down because <laughs> uh, I ended up drinking the day away. <laughs> so anyway, so I'm on the phone with this guy. He's like, so uh, yeah, it's Sarah in here. And uh, so I said, well, what's the cost? He said, oh, no, there's no cost. It's it's all covered. You just need to get yourself here. And and then he says, are you, are you, is your spouse coming with you? I'm like my spouse, right? Because I'd done this all drawn stuff and I've done all these other things that were just about me just about the injured veteran. And I said, well, I don't know. I Sure, I think so. I think she could come. And I asked her, I called over to her, she said, well, I guess, yeah. And I said, so what well, will she cost? No, nope, no cost for her either. I'm like, wow. Wow, well, I was right, yeah. You know, this is uh, unusual, I'm thinking. So we get there, we drive up. Calabogie's not far from us, three, four hours, three and a half hours or so. And uh, we're pulling in and I look at the hill and I'm like, there's no way. Like, I've got some physical injuries and there's no way I'm making it down that hill. Like, you guys are out of your mind. And it was Sunday. We did a meet and greet Sunday. And I stood at the door of this room that the, all these people were in that I didn't know and I wanted nothing to do with. And my wife is there and she's kind of got her hand on my back, expecting me to, to take off any minute. And uh, we got introduced to our instructors. Everyone had their own instructor for the week. And they're adaptive ski instructors. So if you've got some conditions, some physical disabilities or abilities, if you will, that you ski to those those abilities. So she says to the one my instructor, because I got introduced first, uh, so um, tomorrow morning, will we'll we meet you over? And he's like, oh, no, no, my dear your instructor is so-and-so and she's like what and they took her off and she they're like you know it, you're not no you're not here to look after lawrence you're here to look after you wow and it was it it was the first time that 
we'd ever experienced that. We'd never had that before. And and I it was well, it's it's Andy Andrea's to speak to, like her feeling left out of any of my recovery. But it, you know what? Now we're I think ten years later. I'm a level one adaptive ski instructor now. I've worked with uh, another program here near Trenton with uh, kids with physical and cognitive limitations, and we get them up on the hill skiing. And, you know, I go now every year to the winter sports clinic and I, I, I get my, my peers on skis and they're like, I'll never be able to do that. I'm like, yeah, you will. Because we'll make sure you do. And it's it was such a sense of accomplishment and normalcy to do that and feel the adrenaline of participating in, in something that's... It was... And a lot of veterans, members, we like that intense sport, I think. There's a friend of mine who was a, a SAR tech, and uh, I met him through that program. And he had been injured and uh, had some physical limitations. And I remember once he put skis on, he was there. It, he wasn't, there was no limitations. You you couldn't, I, I could barely keep up with him. I mean, we got GPS one time on the hill at like 85 kilometers an hour. And you would never have known this man was, had, had to, he, he, yeah, he could barely walk across the room. I had to help him step down the steps. But as soon as he got his bindings in, it was crazy. I learned so much in that program. That's amazing. It's not just amazing. It is, it's life-changing is what it was for me. It was one of those big, big points. Then, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sitting here and my, my wife is, is prodding me. She's pointing at my my first service dog on the floor. I was released from the military in 2009, medically released. Um, this, this is not easy for me. I didn't want to get out. I was, I was a soldier. I was, you, you know, you can take the, the boy out of the army. You can't take the army out of the boy. Um, I didn't want to get out and I was, unceremoniously Friday done. And uh, I was devastated. I, I didn't know what to do. I, I struggled. And uh, there was, we adopted a dog from the Humane Society, uh, a big Newfie girl. And uh, she and me became inseparable. We were, I, I didn't go anywhere that she couldn't come with me. And she passed. Uh, she was, we didn't know how old she was. We didn't know any history about her. So, you know, we kind of gave her her best life. She ended up with a big lymphoma and we had the vet out and she passed on the front yard. Wow, I'm so, sorry. That's tough, I'm sorry. Yeah, it was, you know what? I, it, it's the only way to stop that pain is to not have a dog and, I have three right now, so. I agree with you 100%. Exactly. Again, that that dog, at, at one point, I was ready to, to leave. I was, you know, sitting out on a rock, and I was, it, I'd made that call in my head that, you know, everyone would be better without me. And I sound like a blubbering idiot. <laughs> But it's 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 that intense, and uh, anyone that's felt that intensity knows what I'm talking about. And then I I look down, and she's sitting in front of me, looking at me, like just not not making a sound, just looking at me. And I thought, well, there's there's someone or something that wants me. And I mean, it, it sounds terrible that it wasn't my son, it wasn't my wife, it was just a stupid dog. Lawrence, there's a lot of people that's going to resonate with because, I mean, ultimately, I don't know, dogs, there's a, different, there's a different connection with animals. I think a lot of times, again, we know that we're not being judged. We know we can be who we want to be. We don't have to 
try to be better. We don't have to try to wear a better mask or a cleaner mask or a clearer mask. We can yeah. just be us and yeah, the dog that. forgives us, you know, and that may include yelling and then apologizing. And the dog still looks at us the same way. And uh, it's refreshing. I find it refreshing. My psychologist suggested maybe looking at a dog. And then she she talked about uh, Medrick Kuzno, who was a man that walked from uh, Nova Scotia to, to Ottawa to raise awareness for post-traumatic stress in veterans. He was a, a helicopter pilot. He lives with stress injury now too. So I did some research and uh, I, I came across an organization called National Service Dogs, which is uh, a provider of, of service dogs for uh, originally for uh, families with uh, autism. And uh, they realized that a lot of the training and a lot of the characteristics of the dog carry over to, to trauma. And they started providing service dogs for first responders and uh, veterans that uh, have been diagnosed with PTSD. And uh, so I was, 2015, I was placed with a dog named Lynx. Believe it or not, my initial injury back in the early 80s uh, our operating vehicle was called a Lynx. The young woman, it gets better, the young woman who puppy raised Lynx, um, she named him Lynx. I didn't name him Lynx. She, and they tried to get her to change his name to a two-syllable name. So they suggested Lincoln. And she tried that, she said, for a week or so. And she said, no, nope, he's a Lynx. So they kept that name. So she fought to keep that name on him, not knowing, well, th there was no connection at the time. He was eight week old puppy and she raised him until he was 18 months old. Um, and, but anyway, so he was almost three when we were placed together and uh, he is now retired. Um, and he, uh, he hangs out with Andy and he works with some yoga program that she does for it. I'll let her talk about her yoga. Um, but anyway, he retired last fall, and now I have another dog from NSD, Roxy, and she's uh, she's a little black lab, and so she comes with me everywhere now. We talked earlier about the hiding and not showing things, and, and I can remember, and I was about two months short of getting links. I knew I was getting them. I'd already been approved, and I realized that I was now going to have to go out in public, and people were going to know there was something wrong with me because I had a dog that was vested and with me in the supermarket, with me at a restaurant, and that was a huge struggle. I, back then, I didn't tell anyone. I don't even know if my family. Well, I know my family didn't know um, because. I attend AA meetings, and uh, my cousin celebrated a uh, one year, and she asked me to come speak at her meeting. And <laughs> we get there, all my other cousins are there, and we're we were pretty close. So I I talk about my story. I talk about, and that's that is part of my story. My trauma is part of my story and my life. And today, I I believe if I can if I can speak this then and I touch someone, then any struggle I have speaking it, it's irrelevant because someone else has gone, wow, like he can talk about that. And I feel the same. Back to my initial non debrief on that that last mission. I going to we're gonna open up junior ranks so you guys can go have some drinks and, and calm down a bit. Like that was our debrief. That's it crazy yeah i'm thankful today i don't believe that goes on in the military i think it does i'm i'm not sure because i'm not in the military anymore i'm not in an operational unit so i'm not exactly sure but god i fucking hope it doesn't i hope they they debrief properly and i can remember coming back from from a deployment 
and we all sit in a big auditorium and here's your form for your social workers going to talk to you. Um, I was in the Air Force at that time and one of they had handed out a questionnaire. One of the questions was, do you feel any uh, any stress and, you know, are you sleeping OK? And I answered, yes, I am. No, I'm not sleeping OK. Um, yes, I'm drinking more and thinking, OK, you know, I'm kind of reaching out here. I never heard a thing back. You know, so all lip service. It, well, it, it's funny because I had a friend of mine that you uh, you talked to in 2019. We were teammates at Warrior Games, which again is another of those recovery stories for me, but not for my wife and my son. It was a struggle for them, and it's another one of those focus on the on the the member, the injured person, not making it a family thing. Um, but, and did I say this before? Andy said to me, maybe you should reach out and, you know, you could do something like that. And I'm like, oh, maybe you should do something like that because that's a different perspective. I'd heard a few of your, and, but it was always talking to that, that member, the, the injured person. Um, I know you, you, had, you had one wife on, I think it was 14. Yeah. Claire Sobkowitz, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, but speaking of which, kudos to him. Like, what a story, man! I've got some cracked armor now. So that's and great. It's, it's a beautiful. They're, they're it's beautiful stuff. It's amazing. I love it, and I I wear it often. So, so there's some things that you've said in there that I find uh, obviously remarkable, and and I really like to touch on them some more for the listeners before we go over and and hear injury aside, but. You had mentioned for a long time, nobody knew and you didn't want to tell anyone. And it got to a point where we're talking much further along to where you now have a dog that's meant to assist and help. And you had a big concern again, that all of a sudden people are going to know. And the reason I'm asking you this is because pretty much everyone inclusive of myself struggle with this at some point i mean very and there's people that don't ever get over that struggle and i guess what i'm trying to do is just put out there the realities of here's what i was afraid of here's what i was concerned about here's what i didn't want anyone to know are you able to share those things about you why it is you didn't want people to know well it's a stigma i didn't want people i thought i was a fucking coward yeah because you know i didn't want anyone else thinking that i'll share another story with you there was a gentleman I met on the train going to Trenton to get on a plane to go to Cornwallis. I met this guy there, and we we hit it off. Um, his name was Al Wright. Um, we went through Cornwallis, both posted out to Calgary together. We went to Germany together. We did a couple tours together. We, we lived together. We never had a falling out, me and Al, and we knew each other. Uh, he passed uh, last year until and i was there basically when he passed um we were close i'm going through veterans affairs for an award for my ptsd because someone had pushed me towards it i had to call i called him because i was doubting that any of this had happened i thought you know the the one incident there was well there was a couple incidents but I, I called him one night, said, you know, I gotta I gotta ask you something, buddy. And he's like, Holy shit, yeah. Yeah. And and because he was there and he said he'd never told anyone either. It's like what two guys that are that fucking close. Yeah. And we don't even share that with each other. That's that's how much of a stigmatism it is. And it's it's fucking bullshit. It is absolute People, friends are deep throat in their fucking 38s because some asshole is making you feel like you shouldn't say anything, that you're a fucking less of a human being because you reacted to a, a horrible incident in a very normal way. Sorry, I get, I get really choked up because there's no reason for that 
no, no reason at all. I agree. I agree. And the fact that you are Lawrence, I mean, anyone who doesn't know you personally gets the importance of what you just said based on the emotion and the tone that was there. So I applaud you for that. And I, I was the exact same way. I have, fuck man, 20 years, 20 years. I was going, knowing that I had a problem, knowing that it was, and pretty much figuratively going, I'm thinking it's PTSD, but fuck, I think everyone who does this job has PTSD. I was never diagnosed. I kind of threw it out there and, and left it, but I didn't tell anybody that I certainly didn't go speak to, you know, a, a colleague, uh, some of my best friends that I work with, some of my best friends outside of it, my wife, like, why? I mean, again, like, I agree with you. You feel like you're a coward. You feel like, what the fuck is wrong with me? I'm the one that protects people. It's my job to protect. It's my job to protect my family. It's my job to protect and serve my community. Yep. And I do that. I Absolutely. do it, right? And so I don't know where the disconnect personally with me was because the reality is I was terrified most of the time, especially well, when I went into dangerous calls. Fuck yeah, I was terrified, but I kept moving forward. Yeah, that's the reality. And it took me a long time to realize I wasn't a coward. I kept doing what I need to do. It's just it kept cutting and cutting and cutting until it finally became the death of a thousand cuts. It just left so many scars. And so I applaud you, brother. I applaud you big time because I concur with you completely. It is absolutely fucking brutal. And that stigma, it's, it just fucking eats us alive. And that, sir, is what you and I are doing today is telling everybody we don't really give a shit what you say. I don't care anymore what you say because what you say and what you think really doesn't impact me in my path. You agree with that? Absolutely. Uh, well, how can I not? I mean, I hear you say that and I think in my head and I said it to several people, fuck you because you don't matter. I, I matter. And, and, I'm, and I'm not a coward today. I know I'm not. I wasn't a coward back then, right? We we were scared. We were on the edge. We still did our job. And most of us did it well, very, very well, even though we didn't want to do it anymore. That intensity that I don't know keeps us going. I, I'm not sure that I didn't want to lose my career. Absolutely. Look, the other side of it as well is that when we're in the shit, like that's the thing is I have no problem saying as well. When I was driving to a call, scenarios would go through my head and I was constantly just thinking what I need to pay attention to, what I need to think about, what I need to watch out for, blah, 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 blah. When I left the call, reassess, take a look at what could I have done better, what could have been fantastic, what could I have prevented, fuck, I forgot to look behind that door and that could have been bad. And so I would think and think and think, the point I'm making is during the call, stoic, completely level-headed, doing the job, not thinking at all about my safety, not scared at the time. I was just in the shit. And I truly believe I spoke to a U.S. Uh, Marine who had served over in uh, Ramadi and Fallujah and Helmand Province. Ugh. And he said the same thing is that this is a guy who within a year redeployed because he wanted to from Ramadi to Fallujah. And that was his thing was that he was struggling with home and he felt like he always had some unfinished business. He felt it was when he was in that his mind was more active because it had to be, it didn't have these periods of inactivity for him to think shitty things. And so I agree with you in terms of when you said, yeah, you just wanted to get back. You wanted to go back and taking it away from yep. you in an, and, and exactly as you said, to be unceremoniously done, that's fucking insulting. It was devastating to me. I was totally crushed um, because I felt useless because I wasn't wanted anymore after so many years of doing that. And yeah. 
Absolutely. And so, Andrea, where do you come in on this? I mean, obviously you come in that you you meet this gentleman and then things start changing. I presume at some point when you start realizing that he's struggling with some issues. Yeah. I th- well, so we met in, say, 2000. Yeah, we met in 2000. By 2001, you know, we were, we were living together. I was pregnant. Mm-hmm. And, and, <laughs> but, you know, in, in the first, maybe say a couple of years of our relationship, I mean, I just, I knew there were things he didn't want to talk about. I knew there were places he had been or different things that had happened that he just he didn't like to talk about. I could see him sort of kind of having a bit of a visceral reaction to it. So we just didn't talk about them. Like we just, I changed the subject. I, you know, and he was pretty good at, you know, kind of switching gears and, you know, redirecting so that, you know, he could kind of squash it down a little bit further because it had crept up a little bit. So, you know, I thought, okay, well, that's fine. We just don't talk about those things and things will be okay. Um, You know, I also figured out pretty quick that he didn't like to go to places that were very crowded. I remember one time, though, friends of mine were playing, there was a band or something playing at a bar in Kingston, and we had been invited out. And again, I didn't know anything was preventing him from coming to this crowded bar. So we went to this crowded bar. But I remember at one point in the evening, and it was some guy out on the dance floor that just happened to look our way. And Lawrence didn't like the look on his face. And I remember turning and looking at him. And I remember thinking, he is not in this room with me anymore. He's gone to a completely different place. Because I remember it like it was yesterday, and it's probably 20 years ago. And then in that instant, Lawrence was headed across the dance floor. Yep. Because he was going to rip that guy's head off. Oh, I know it. Yep. You know, afterwards, couldn't even really explain to me what that was about, because he wasn't there. He was gone like to a completely different place. And so, you know, it kind of adding up all those things and, and, and yeah, there had been some pretty bad stuff go on early in our relationship. And there were times when I thought, what am I doing here? Like, I can't continue. But uh, I remember to be honest, I don't even think he knows this, but, um, you, you know, sitting on the couch in what is now, my living room, but at the time was his living room because I wasn't yet living with him and I knew I was pregnant. I hadn't told him yet. And there were just some things going on because of his addictions and stuff like that. And sitting on that couch, he wasn't home from work yet and trying to figure out the fuck was I going to do? Yeah. Because I knew I was pregnant and I was pregnant with, you know, with a baby for someone that for reasons unknown to me, really wasn't treating me very well. Yeah, well. So I, I remember thinking I could just call my parents in Kingston and tell them to come get me, and he'd never have to know. Wow. You know, that's, yeah. that's just pretty deep, and I'm probably freaking my husband out because I don't think he knows this. But that's how bad it was. That you know, And again, I had no idea. I didn't know it was PTSD. I just knew that I somehow had ended up with this military guy who just was really fucking messed up. And at that point, I thought maybe I had just, you know, landed with another jerk, right? Like, I didn't have the greatest track record on relationships. But something in me told me to just kind of tough it out and see what was going on. So he got through some stuff. And again, I always knew there was something, something was going on. And I didn't, I didn't quite know what it was. And then he went on the deployment in 2004. And it was when he came back from that, that things just got, I would say they got a lot worse. Yeah. Because everything that he had just squashed down for all those years, right. Had just all just come spewing out with these deployments and he was a hot mess. And I, you know, our son was three and I just was like, we need to do something about this. 
because there's something more going on here. I mean, you're, there's no way you can be this much of an asshole. You need to talk to somebody because we're not going to survive this. We will not survive this. If, if things keep going as they are, we will be finished. There's no doubt in my mind. I will not stay and I will not raise my son in this sort of an environment. And so that was when he he went and he went to treatment and, and stuff like that. You know, and I can remember sitting in the, he went to Bellwood for, for treatment and they have a family program. So for like about a week of the, however many weeks he was up there, we, the family members come up. And I remember sitting in a session with the physician on the, on the team there. And, and he said, he started off the session and he said to everybody, he said, you know, your, your husband, your son, your daughter, blah, blah, you know, they're substance and behavior addictions, they're, they're a problem, aren't they? And, and we're, we're all just like, um, yeah. And he said, but they're not a problem. He said, they're the solution. Wow. There's a bigger problem, you know, and <clears throat> they are what makes the bad feelings go away. So, but what's the problem? And so, and I remember that, like I said, sort of almost kind of a bit of a light bulb going on for me. And again, still didn't think PTSD because I didn't really know that much about it, but um, and it was sort of in that sort of period of time that the diagnosis was made that for me, it was a huge relief because now I had this explanation for things. I could understand why things had been the way they were. I don't think it was much of a relief for Lawrence at the time because, again, that was in 2004, 2005, and, and it's still, you know, you, you didn't exactly stand up and announce that in the military, right? It was, there wasn't a lot of being public about it. So I think that it was still several, several years before um, I think he could actually really even speak about it or admit to his closest friend or family member what he was living with. You know, and you just sort of, as, as the family member, you just kind of figure out pretty quick who to tell everything to and who to tell some of it to and who you don't share anything with. Right. Yeah, because it's just, you, you really have to kind of figure out who, what different people are going to be able to handle too, right? Because there are relationships in your life that you, you know, you can't just cut them out entirely. So sometimes you kind of got to go, okay, well, this is how much we're going to tell them about what's going on and because they can handle that and it's not going to end a relationship. And, but I mean, it was all a journey for sure. And I mean, I think we've, we just kind of had to figure, we've often talked about that our recoveries, because, you know, Lawrence has his recovery and I believe I have my own, are like puzzles. And we, we've had to find what our pieces are for that, right? Like, so with Lawrence, you know, he talks about sport and animals and skiing and stuff like that. And his, he has a really good psychologist. So, so, you know, those are his puzzle pieces, or at least some of them. And, and then I had to find my own pieces and I have similar pieces because skiing and sport and stuff like that and, and animals. But, you know, I think using that analogy because i often say to people like ptsd looks so different for every individual and it looks so different for every family it's true absolutely true yeah you know and i tried you know early in his diagnosis there was a support group for spouses um on the base and i tried that and i did i met some really lovely people through it and i have a few people from it that I still am, am really good friends with. But I also felt at times that it just ended up being an extension of the stress at home because if, you just go and sit and drink coffee and people be complaining about their husbands or Veterans Affairs or CISIP or whoever. And it was just, sometimes it just felt like a big bitch fest. Yeah. And I would, I remember one time coming home and walking down the driveway, so upset and agitated for no real reason other than I had just spent an hour listening to people complain. I was so upset that I almost wanted to walk in the door and pick a fight with Lawrence because I was so irritated that that was literally the only thing available to me. Yep. 
Understood. as a spouse. That's understandable. You know. Yeah. And, you know, meanwhile, he had psychology appointments, he had his addiction appointments, he could go to this, he could go to that, he could go to soldier on this or whatever. And I just, the sum total of the supports available to me was this once a month coffee and bitch session at the MFRC. So I stopped going to that and I just figured, you know, what, I'm just going to make my own way. I'm just going to, you know, find my own things that work for me and not rely on anybody else to, to make it happen for me. And that's when, I guess that's right around the time that, that we, as Lawrence mentioned, we were invited to the Winter Sports Clinic. And, and that, that was a game changer for me because it just like all of a sudden somebody actually gave, like cared about me as his wife. And not me as his wife to come and take care of him, but me as his wife that I needed some healing and some just time to be around people who get it. That's a game changer. That had to be relieving of some way just to go finally, someone's getting it, that I'm in this as well. Yeah. And it's because, you know, when, when you're a military wife, and I mean, honestly, I only really, I mean, so I can only kind of speak to it from a small scale, but is that in my entire relationship with Lawrence, I only went through what, six months of deployment? because he did two rounds over in Mirage. I know military wives whose husbands have done far more in the way of deployment. So I just got lucky that Lawrence didn't deploy a lot during our relationship. But, you know, when they go on deployment, and this is long before any PTSD is, you know, we're at home taking care of the kids. When he was overseas, I was I was commuting to Kingston every day. I was taking care of a three year old. I was um, half time taking care of a seven year old stepdaughter. You know, I'm here doing it all. You know, and and I mean, not saying that he's not having a rough go over there, but at the same time, it's like we are a hundred percent on duty all the time. And then they come home, and then there's that huge adjustment period of okay, well, I know that's how we used to do it, but here's how we do it now. Or here's how we do it when you're not here. And so you kind of get through that, but then all of a sudden this injury comes up, right? And so so it's like, okay, let's handle this. Let's do this. And as Lawrence was saying, like the spouse and the family members, we're the safe ones, right? So they can go out into public and they can put on the face and be charming and amiable and all signs, you know, that there's no problems at all. But when they come home and they feel safe, that's where they can just not always be nice. Yeah. You know what I mean? 100%. Like, yeah, the mask be comes an asshole. Yeah. Be an asshole. Absolutely. Because we're the safe ones. Yeah. Absolutely. And so you're kind of, you know, and again, you're dealing with that. So it's like, okay, well, you know, we'll figure this out too. Well, then all of a sudden there's all these programs for, for him. Like he can go fly fishing. He can go ride horses. He can go do this, he can go do that, right? And again, a thrill to death. I'm so happy that he has it. I'm really glad for that. That's so I hope that it's never perceived that I'm not appreciative of the fact that there are all these programs for people who have sustained injuries and that sort of thing. That's great. But it ends up making it even worse for the family members who are still sitting at home handling everything all by themselves. Yeah. If that makes sense no, at all. It makes you know? perfect sense because, again, you are dealing with this too. So the injury also yeah. becomes your injury. And so it yeah. would get to a point, I can see anyway, where, again, you're home, you're taking care of everything back at home, the finances, the house, raising the children, making sure they get to school. I mean, it's a full-time job, just like you said. Yeah. While Lawrence yeah. is on deployment. Is he, yeah. is he working his ass off? Absolutely. Is he terrified? Absolutely. Oh, for sure. It's not yeah. about that, though. We're not talking about Lawrence right now. We're talking about Andrea. And Andrea's doing all these things. And then all of a mm-hmm. sudden, Lawrence comes back. And I'm speaking figuratively on this, so I'm not saying this literally happened. But you hear things like, thank you for your service. I appreciate what you've done. But nobody fucking looks at you, Andrea, and says that. And the reality is, without you, Lawrence is not in the same position to be able to do those things, to be able to do his service. That requires you as well, but no one is saying that. And then no one is realizing what's going on behind closed doors. Nobody is realizing that the injury bleeds into you and the symptoms start affecting you. And then Mm -hmm. nobody is realizing that you may also need help. You may also need support. 
And that's problematic yeah. because ultimately, if Lawrence and myself, we are dependent on our spouses, well, we need to make sure our spouses have the support so they can maintain the strength that we need. Is that fair to say? Oh, for sure. Yeah. I know I've been offered and I have availed myself of counseling services at various points in time. And that's great, you know, but I guess for me, what, what really was frustrating was just not being able to find anything else other than like, yeah, Veterans Affairs will pay for me to have 10 sessions, you know, if I call and say I'm in crisis sort of thing. But otherwise, you know, not really a lot available to me. And and the thing is, I'm really fortunate. We are very, very fortunate that Lawrence can still work. So, you know, after he was released, he became a civilian contractor for various different companies that contract to the military. So, you know, we are pretty good. So, I mean, if I want, like, I mean, yoga does me huge amounts. Yoga has been key to my recovery. And so if I want to go join a yoga studio or go to a yoga workshop or retreat or whatever, I can, I can pay for it. It's not a big deal, right? right? But I have friends whose partners, because of their injuries, they'll never work again. And so they are completely reliant on their military pension and or their veteran affairs pension. And that's their source of income. So the, uh, you know, they can't go and, you know, pay however much money to go to a yoga class or to join an art therapy group or stuff like that. And nobody's out there funding it, right? Well, I, actually, I'm going to say, I'm not going to say nobody's out there funding it because there is somebody out there funding it and I'm going to get there in a minute. And so I felt like there needed to be something, especially because of the Winter Sports Clinic. That's what I always say that I credit them with planting the seed because finally somebody got it. Somebody got it that I as the spouse actually mattered and I needed something and they helped me get there. And so that was when I started sort of thinking, okay, what, what could there be for? And so I, in conjunction with my local yoga studio, I just approached them and I said, you know, I, I want to do something. I want to do something because this is a military community and I know there are people out there that are, and it's so isolating. It really is, especially when, when you're, you know, you're dealing with PTSD and addictions and stuff like that. There's not a lot of people you can talk to about that. No, you're right. Right. You're and right. so, yeah, you figure out who in your life you can share certain amounts to. But then there comes a point where you just can't share that anymore either, because a lot of times it's, you know, you sort of get that look on their face or that reaction of, well, what, that's still a problem? Yep. Like, really? They still have PTSD? Yep. It's like, um, yeah. <laughs> Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's not, it's not, it's not a venereal disease. It's, it's something completely different. You, yeah, exactly. Right? Penicillin so, doesn't make this go away. Yeah. And so, you know, I just went to my, my local, I knew what yoga had done for me. I knew. It, and so I went to my local studio who they're really good friends of mine anyways, and they're a military family. And I said, you know, I want to do something. I want to do something for people in this community and I want it to be free. I do not want anybody to have to pay for this. And she would be a military wife. You know, she said, I'm totally in. You tell me what you want to do and we're going to do this. And so we created this program here in Trenton. Um, we called it Renew. And it basically, it sort of combined yoga, but all kinds of other things. Like we, we got someone to come in and do art therapy and we got someone to do a sound bath. And so it was more about kind of bringing this community together. It's amazing. So that. People could just come and you could just be there and you're being with people who get it and you're there as who you are, not as somebody's wife, not as the wife of an injured veteran, not as someone who themselves is injured. You're there to kind of reconnect with the person that you were long before all this shit came up. And I love that you say that, that you're not someone else's wife, because that has to be the annoying thing is, oh, it's Lawrence's wife. Fuck off. No, it's not. It's Andrea. Well, right? Like, yeah. yeah. Well, and, and I mean, I will admit at times I have defined myself by his injury. Unconsciously done it. But 
you kind of start doing that. You just, everything sort of orbits around that and, and you decide what you can and cannot do and will and will not, you know, have based on that one dynamic. And I thought if I can just create something where for like, one or two hours these people could just come into this space and not have to worry about that shit and they're not there as anything other than themselves then we'll be successful right and sure. so we did that and and the reason i really i take every opportunity to share this whole idea and concept is because i take no i hold no ownership in it and I want people to understand that it was so easy to do. It was having a conversation with, and in my case, it was a yoga studio, but maybe it's an art studio or maybe it's a gym or maybe it's a whatever, but it's that you can create your own community. There are so many people with so many talents that would, that I've, absolutely certain would would give them up for an hour or two in order to create this space for people who just need to come together and just be together because they get it if that makes sense perfect sense and whether it's for wives or whether it's for kids and you know because like children and families with ptsd is such a challenging group to tap into because it's such a wide age range and stuff like that but having things for them because as much as we'd love to think that we hid my husband's injury from our son. And I think for the most part, a lot of the dynamics we were able to kind of shield him from, which I'm grateful for. But there were other aspects. I mean, I always say it's, it, it, I observed my eight-year-old son one time as we stood in a restaurant and he told the hostess before she seated us that we needed a table by the wall. Yeah. He had no idea why we needed a table by the wall. Yeah. He just knew, he knew that dad needed to sit at a table by the wall. And it was very matter of fact. It wasn't, it was, he wasn't stressed or anything, nope. but I just, I remember thinking, wow, like, you know, as much as we think we shield the, from it all, we don't. There's things they pick up on the for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, I just, I'm, I'm really, really passionate about just having things for the families and, and, you know, true patriot love. I don't know if you've ever sort of made mention of them prior to this, but I mean, they are absolutely tremendous as a, as an organization in Canada that recognize the family, that they give as much of their funding towards family members and programs for family members as they do to sort of the actual veteran or or military member or first responder. So it's so wounded warriors. Yeah, wounded warriors. Too. They're another they're one. They've warriors. got the kids camp and yeah. very much a lot of family programs, special programs. I just very, very passionate about it because again, we live with these these injuries and stuff. Maybe not quite as intensely as Lawrence does or, you know, the veteran and first responder does, but we still live with it. Absolutely. And so yeah. it's, uh, yeah, so that, Andrea, that's my little soapbox on that. <laughs> Andrea, is there a way, because I, I have a funny feeling people are going to be thinking, I would like to be able to start something like this in my yep. community. Is yep. there a way that people do this? Can they reach out to you in some way? I would uh, 100% welcome anybody who, like, I'll, I can give you my contact information. And um, I would. Like, like I said, I, nothing would make me happier than to see other communities, you know, or even if it's somebody, you know, in here in Ontario or something, if they're within traveling distance, I would come and, and help them put something together. Because it seems like, I know for me, when I decided to do something, I don't, well, I, when I, not when I decided to do something, when I decided I was frustrated and I needed something, it just seemed like such a big thing to do. Like, what the hell was I going to create? Because, man, it, it, you know, what did it even look like? And then and then I just thought, no, nope, I'm just going to try something. And if it works, great. And if it didn't, it didn't. But at least I knew I tried. And uh, and so for me, again, because my basis is yoga, then I, uh, I started there and we just built from that. But uh, there's just there's so many things that can be done either at low cost or even free 
couple of hours of yoga or a couple of hours like doing art therapy or, you know, going to a craft session or something like that. My God, that's huge. And it, it, I'm sure to some people it doesn't seem like a big deal, but it can make all the difference. It's what keeps you in the game. It can, You know, it makes you go, okay, I can take care of me. So now I can go back and be better to help and support and, and stand by Lawrence as he, you know, he goes through whatever he's going through. Absolutely. Right. Because I mean, it, yeah, PTSD comes and goes and some days are good and some days aren't and, and shit happens. And we need to stand by each other and support each other when, when that's going on. But if we're not taking care of ourselves, then we can't do that. Well, if you don't take care of yourself, you cannot possibly take care of another yeah. person. That's the reality of it. Yeah. You have to look out yeah. for yourself. You have to make that time for yourself. And ultimately, this yoga group, these art groups, craft groups, whatever, this is how time can be made for you to find what you love, what you enjoy. And it's important. It's very important. Yeah. Lawrence? Yes, that's me. Listening to all this and your journey and Andrea's, and it's it's an amazing, I mean, it's a fantastic story. It's very relatable. What is the takeaway that you want to share with people? And I mean people who are struggling and really don't know what the fuck they should be doing. And as well as people who may not be struggling, but may know someone who they believe is struggling. What is the takeaway from your story? What do people need to know? I, I think it's just being open, talking about it. And I touch on it early in my story. I, I think that if I'm, and it's a mental health stigmatism, we need to get rid of that. We only can get rid of that by talking, by sharing. I feel so comfortable around people that get it. And it's, I hate to say it's mostly, mostly veterans. Um, a couple uh, law enforcement officers I know, um, and I got a buddy of mine. We don't talk about our injury, but we talk about what's going on in our in our everyday stuff. And he gets it. I don't have to explain it to him. I, I mean, I know he was on a deployment, at least one in Afghanistan. See, I don't even know because it doesn't fucking matter. And that's. You know what? That's a rough question. Um, Don't read too deep into it. I mean, I guess that's the thing is because I know you are intellectual, but I think there's a lot of things people can take away from your story. I mean, a lot of it is just, well, I mean, Lawrence, here's a great question. You said that, you know, you joined at a young age and then you spoke about 1982. I mean, how long do you think that your injuries, like when do you think your injuries began? In 1982. I joined in 81. In 1982. 1982. That right? was my first injury. Right? Yep. 1982. And then... But I didn't limp. I didn't limp. No. No. Right? And it's... You know what? That's... A dog will not show you, unless it's absolutely devastatingly painful, will not show you that pain physically. And I didn't show anyone any of my pain. And that's why I think the big takeaway is... Fucking share it. Talk to me. Reach out to someone you trust. I have friends that I, I'll pick up the phone at 2 in the morning. I'll fucking run out here to the phone ringing at any time of the day or night. Because you never know when it's someone reaching out. And I've been there. I've been to the fucking brink. And I don't like that. So share. You know what? We have my sex you say that all the fucking time and every time you say it i say thanks larry because i know how important that is and so i think that's you know i'm sitting here thinking what do you what take away from my story take away from my story stop fucking hiding stop hiding you know i got a dog now and i have a dog with me no matter where i go and you know what andy said when you know okay you're still you're not better from ptsd uh, we need we do garbage tags here. How stupid this is! I, I everything's a story for me. <laughs> um, my son he takes the garbage. That was one of his jobs. He's Twenty two. He's going to university. 
Um, he's a whole nother story himself. My God, what an amazing young man he is. I'm so proud of him and I like him so much. That's awesome. I love him, That's but fantastic. I like him. That, that, wow. So he took the garbage out. We didn't have any tags. I said, oh, I'll just, I'll just go down to the, the ESO and get some tags, a little corner store. So you, you're going to take links with you? <laughs> no, I'm just running in and getting tags. I'll be, I'll be right back. Well, Almost an hour later, 45 minutes, hour later, I show back up at the house and he's like, you didn't get tags, did you, dad? <laughs> I said, no, I couldn't go in. I couldn't go in. Yeah. And this was like six months ago, tops. Like, no, I'm not better. So I've got a dog with me all the time. Like, I'm sharing. Guess what? There's something wrong here. And he's, he's putting up her hand. Hey, teacher, teacher. <laughs> I have a takeaway, too, if I could share it. Please do. Now, and I just sort of want to echo Lawrence's kind of thing about sharing and is reach out to people and talk to people. And, you know, you will learn that can be a really great filter <laughs> as to who you do and don't want in your life anymore. Because if you reach out and somebody doesn't get it or doesn't understand, then then that's okay. Because somebody, Welcome. some no, but somebody will. Somebody will. And, and I had an experience recently and and it's you know I've, I've lived with lawrence for 22 years no 20 23 oh, years oh, 23 years sorry I, and you know i've also there have been mental health issues in my own family and stuff like that plus i worked as a social worker for 15 years and recently have really been struggling with some anxiety issues myself and i i wasn't telling anybody I wasn't even telling Lawrence, right? And then um, I teach yoga at the, um, there's a counseling center here in Trenton and I do trauma sensitive private yoga with some of the clients there. And I got there one morning and I was a hot fucking mess. Like I could barely talk. And I had to tell the, you know, the receptionist and I'd, I'd sort of alluded to the fact, oh, I'm just not feeling well today. And then I thought, screw it. And I, I said to her, I said, she said, how are you feeling? And I said, honestly, I'm really struggling with anxiety right now. And she, and I was so worried about what she was going to say. Because I thought, oh, she's going to be like, oh my God, here we go. And she was like, okay, you just do what you need to do. And, and you know, you only do what you can and, and I can cancel things, but you need to be okay. And, and she kept checking on me. It amazed me how worried I was about telling her. And just some of the people that I have reached out to and, and shared with through this and, and have been nothing but understanding. And, and I mean, I've known that through Lawrence's journey is just that I just kept sharing and I kept reaching out and I did find wonderful people and I found people who got it and I found people who support me and would be there for me and I will be there for them. So I, I just wanted to echo Lawrence's thing about like, just, just keep talking. Like, don't stop talking. Don't, never, ever, ever stop talking and don't be alone in this. Absolutely. Andrea Lawrence, I really, really appreciate your time and this conversation. I've been looking forward to this one for a while. We spoke a little while back and getting the opportunity to talk to you both has been fantastic today. Truth be told, Larry, I've been worried as hell about this and I'm, I'm, I'm still a little worried about putting it out there. So that point being... It's still a struggle, and so I get it. And that's why I give you so much respect for you doing this every week. You're putting it out there, and I, amazing hero. Yeah, I'm grateful too because I know what he's gotten out of this from what you're doing, and and so I'm grateful to you for what you're doing. So thank you. you get in my truck, and Papa Tango Sierra Delta is what's linked to my radio. <laughs> um, and I, I love the dance one, buddy, that I know that was me for so long. I came back from, I don't even remember where I, I went home to visit because I was a single guy. And I, I met up with a buddy of mine that we were best friends through high school. And my God, he was so fucked. He was so weird. Like, what do you don't drink or what, man? Uh, you know? And I, I look back today and I laugh because he, he wasn't weird. I was weird. I was the one that had changed so drastically. But but you don't see it at the time. No, right? not at all. So. Yeah, not at all. 
I agree. Anyways, anyways like I said, you, you're, um, uh, I really appreciate you and what you do. Thanks, brother. I appreciate you guys. I appreciate everything you've done. Thank you so much, Andrea, for taking care of my brother. No problem. Lawrence, thank you so much for your service and for also taking the time that day when you were sitting on a rock to look at that dog and to know that dog, despite nothing being heard, you knew that something was being said and you could feel that and it made a difference and I appreciate that. And I appreciate you having the strength to keep going. For everyone out there listening, there's a number of things to take away from this episode. Listen to one thing that Lauren said, and this is important. I don't struggle with PTSD. I live with it. I'm not better, but I live with it. Lawrence may still be dealing with PTSD, and I believe he will for the rest of his life, as will I. However, looking at everything this man has been through and where he is now, he may not be better, but he has definitely grown post-trauma. As for Andrea, what's very important to take away is that you have to share with people in order to give those people the opportunity to understand. Otherwise, how can they? Please stand up and speak out. It's okay that you are not okay. My name is Larry Payton. I have your six. Please also have mine. Don't go away. There's so much left to do. So many things I want to say and I sing here. Don't make the change If it rains every single day I'll fight to blow it all away